you know, it's hard enough to have a mental illness or to have depression, but to have to worry about what other people might think of you because you have this illness, that is such an injustice and it, it's just so unfair. I didn't do anything bad to become depressed and it can happen to anybody. If I could describe it, if you were in a room full of people, I would always be in my mind, the person that's sort of cowering on one side of the room while the rest of the world or everybody else is on the other side of the room and I just don't belong. When I was about 12 years old, I remember my mom taking me to see our family doctor because she was really concerned. There was such a dra drastic change in the way I was and um, I remember the doctor telling me that I didn't have anything to be unhappy about, that I had a wonderful mother and a family and that I should be happy. High school, it got much worse. I had a suicide attempt, and I remember one of the uh, doctors being angry with me and saying, do you have any idea how much time you've wasted, valuable time, people's time that you've wasted? It was really crushing. I, I had terrible feelings about myself already, and I felt I did waste everybody's time. That was what my, that's what I was doing on Earth, sort of was wasting people's time and anyone that had anything to do with me. I felt so badly about myself and uh, I especially felt a huge amount of guilt because of what I knew I'd put my parents through. And I think this is really a big part of anyone that suffers from depression. You're aware of the hurt and the terrible feelings and anguish that you're putting anyone associated with you through. The very sad part about it is I don't know what anyone could have said to me or done at the time with the resources that were available at the time or the knowledge that people knew at the time that really would have made a difference. That is what is so terrible to me about the depression or the mental illness. A lot of the anguish and the hurt and what can maybe tear families apart is family members feeling guilty or thinking, oh, I should be able to do something. Or The most that you can do is be supportive, let the person talk to you, let them know that you are there. But seek help yourself. If you're having trouble dealing with it, seek help for yourself. Get guidance and get you know, knowledge and understanding of what you can do and the limits of what you can do. Because there are limits to what you can do to somebody with a mental illness. You need to seek professional help. I'm not ashamed of having depression. That doesn't shame me. What does shame me, and it's hard to say, is the state of my life and the things that I haven't, haven't experienced. I um, was listening to a show on uh, TV a while ago and the person was talking about all the major life events, happy events that they were looking back on over their life and they named things like social events in high school, going to your prom, graduating from university, getting that first job, marriage, children, on and on. And I can honestly sit here and say I have not experienced any of that. My depression has robbed me of so many things in my life and I feel I just don't want it to rob me of my voice anymore. I want to have a voice about this. It's all very fine to see and I commend people that have great successes in their life and are celebrities talking about mental illness. But a lot of us that have had depression, they are a mental illness. We don't, we aren't able to achieve all these great things in life. But it's been, but just the fact that we can get through the struggle and carry on day-to-day -day function of working or doing whatever you do in your life, it, that is such a major, such a big deal to me and I want to have a voice about that. Oh my God, I can't even imagine. Um, like if I'd never gotten therapy, I would assume I would have killed myself at some point. My name is Matt Watts, and I'm a writer and actor. I worked on a show for the CBC called Michael Tuesdays and Thursdays. Michael's here, Dr. Stober. I have general anxiety disorder and panic disorder. Come on. Come on. It's such a weird thing, you know, because I don't... I've always been talking about this in relation to the show, so it's hard to... I've never actually just talked about the disorder, like, ever. It's a, a constant fear of everything. Your mind is always racing, uh, thinking through worst case scenarios, sweating, heart pounding, 
nausea, sensitivity to light, and uh, exhaustion, I'd say, is a huge part of it because your mind and body is racing all the time. You're just on, on very, very high alert, uh, always aware that uh, there's a potential threat. I did talk therapy for years, and I, I'm still in talk therapy. It's just, it doesn't address specific issues, so it was helpful. I, I actually really like it for um, understanding how the human mind works in general and spotting patterns of behavior. But in terms of treating my anxiety, it wasn't that helpful. We tried uh, a lot of medication, various antidepressants, uh, some benzodiazepines, and uh, they helped, but I didn't like the side effects and <clears throat> it didn't help enough to warrant taking them. It was bad. I couldn't go outside of the house for further than a block. Like I could get out of the house and I could walk about a block and then I'd start to feel really anxious and I'd have to go back. I couldn't go into a grocery store so my girlfriend would have to do the shopping and I'd have to wait for her outside and then we'd go home together. Uh, I couldn't go to see a movie. I couldn't see uh, anything. Uh, I was very, very limited. My world was really small. I questioned whether or not there was any uh, point continuing with life because I didn't know whether or not I'd ever actually be able to function. I, I mean, when I say I hit rock bottom, I hit, I hit uh, rock bottom bottom in that sense that I went to that really dark place where uh, you're not just entertaining the thought, you're actually starting to um, plan it out and figure out, okay, this is the only way out, this is all I can do. And it was then that I realized, okay, I, I have two options here, I've got to, I can kill myself or I can, I can deal with this. I interviewed a couple cognitive behavior therapists. And I met this guy named Mike, uh, who just seemed to get me instantly. And I was in really, really dire straits. And uh, we started doing the work, and I really stuck to the homework and dedicated myself to it. And uh, the results were immediate. Like, it was within a couple of weeks that I was doing things that I hadn't done in years, like riding the subways and uh, taking elevators in, uh, you know, the downtown core, uh, major bank buildings and uh, eating in restaurants and, uh, you know, gradually my world started to expand and, and it, it was really effective and I saw how it worked. And a lot of it was the cognitive work. A lot of it was just keeping a diary and writing things down and challenging your beliefs and under getting a real understanding as to how it is that uh, and negative automatic thoughts and a anxious thoughts um, are affect the way that you feel. You see, this is what I was saying, you're stronger than you think. Well, of course it was hard. There was What's funny about having done the show is I have been shocked at how people have responded to my on. honesty about this. Hi, it's me. Uh, are you are you all right? Oh no, everything's fine. Uh, I think I'm being stalked, so I took another Ativan. Do you, do you want me to come to you? I've had friends, strangers, uh, authority figures, all come up to me and say, oh, "I've been struggling with this for years, and I've told no one." Uh, it's really common um, to the point where I don't even like. There, yeah, it shouldn't be labeled. It's almost like. Being anxious is normal. It's, it's the people who aren't anxious that you have to wonder, wonder about. I mean, how can you not be anxious? It's a, we live in a really crowded, intense, stressful world. Uh, it, you just respond to it like it's nothing. I mean, that, that's weird. Now, we look at addiction. From alcohol to heroin, two former addicts share their experiences of finding their way back to sobriety. Let's take a look. 
If I hadn't gotten sober, I don't believe that I'd still be alive. I mean, I ended up in the hospital twice before the age of 18. I'm Allie. I'm 22 years old, and I'm a recovering drug addict and alcoholic. I don't go around openly telling people that I'm an, I'm an addict and I'm an alcoholic, even though I'm in recovery, because they don't hear the recovering part. They just hear that I'm a drug addict and that I'm a bad person, that I'm lazy, and that I just don't have enough willpower. I show a lot of willpower in other areas of my life. Um, when it comes to drugs and alcohol, um, it's a whole different story. And I think, you know, people say, why can't you just stop? Or, you know, why can't you just have some more positive thinking around it? And I think it's the same thing as telling a schizophrenic person to think their way out of schizophrenia. You know, like this is, um, this is a disease of the mind. Um, it's, it's also a physical allergy. It's just, it's the same thing as someone being allergic to peanuts. They break out in hives um, in anaphylactic shock. For me, I ingest alcohol and I break out and I want more. I was 13 years old when I had my first drink. It progressed uh, extremely fast. By the time I was 14 years old, I started experimenting with harder drugs, uh, namely ecstasy and cocaine. Everything else became a second priority. Um, if, if I needed to get intoxicated or get high, that would come above anything else. And for me, instead of changing my behavior to uh, meet my goals, I changed my goals to match my behavior. I wasn't happy anymore, but the problem for me was in the fact that I couldn't live with the drugs and alcohol and I couldn't live uh, without them. Um, but until I realized for myself that, that I couldn't live this way anymore, there was really nothing anyone could tell me. And um, inevitably I had another overdose. I was referred to services that were trying to help me to take a harm reduction method um, or approach to things. and. Um, because I'm an addict and I'm an alcoholic and I can't just uh, reduce my intake, I constantly need more, um, that didn't really work. The last time I got sober four years ago, I was able um, to kind of surrender to this idea that I wasn't going to be able to get sober on my own, that I needed supports from other recovering alcoholics and addicts in particular. I think that's why maybe the first attempts weren't so successful um, because they were, I was get, seeking help from social workers, from psychiatrists, from, from people that could intellectualize addiction and alcoholism but didn't, had never experienced it themselves. Labeling helped me to identify my problem instead of hindering me. For a long time, I always knew that there was something wrong, that there was something wrong with me. Even like aside from the drugs and alcohol, I just didn't, I never felt comfortable in my own skin. I always felt apart, apart from. So I think once I was able to, to label myself as an addict and alcoholic, um, it was almost a relief in the sense that I finally knew what my problem was and therefore I could find a solution for that problem. I started to see all these improvements in my life. I started to, to see an improvement in my mood. Um, I wasn't so depressed all the time. I wasn't so angry all the time. Um, I, was finally, I was finally free from my addiction. Um, I go out all the time. I'm like a normal 22-year-old um, just without the drugs and alcohol. I go out to nightclubs. I go out to bars. Definitely thinking sobriety was going to be boring um, was a silly thought to have because I have way more fun in sobriety than I ever did drinking or using. I had a heroin addiction for seven years, was sticking needles in my arms and panhandling on the street for money. I was a drug addict, but it was when I started doing heroin that I really found my drug niche. Being addicted to drugs is like having a split personality. In, that's what I experienced. It's, there's flickers, glimmers of a person who's, who's being negatively affected by their addiction and they want to change, 
And then there's this overarching controlling behavior that's chemicalized, that's causing them to do all of these bad things. Heroin is an opiate-based drug. Uh, it's very similar to morphine, um, Oxycontin, and Vicodin, and all of the other opiate-style drugs pretty much have the same chemical formulation. And what it is is a painkiller. It's a nervous system depressant, so it will numb all of the nerve endings. Um, it, it, it basically numbs any type of pain, physical pain, emotional pain, mental pain. When you become an actual functioning user of the drug, and I, and I say functioning because it is a relevant way to describe it, um, it it's about m uh, uh, maintaining a, a kind of a level of, of uh, standard, normal uh, uh, daily living. The, the drug it simply gets you back to a point of feeling okay enough to do the things that you need to do. Um, the only problem is, is that because your attention becomes so much more focused on using the drug and getting the drug, um, the, the rest of your daily routine gets subjugated to that pursuit. That was the time when I realized that I don't have the ability to jump on a bus or a plane or get in a car or drive somewhere and not use the drugs. I had to bring the heroin with me. I had to have some type of an opiate. It's not easy to quit because it feels good and because it takes away your emotional pain. That's the scary part, that confronting the positive aspects that are a part of addiction. People don't use drugs because they want to be drug addicts. People use drugs because of the feelings that they get from the drugs. When you come off of the heroin, your body begins to wake up again. And that process um, is very uncomfortable. So you experience um, uh, extreme skin crawl, anxiety, shakes, hot and cold sweats. Um, in severe cases, you're going to have vomiting, sleeplessness, hallucinations. Um, and that can last anywhere from on the short end about four to five days and typically as long as two to three weeks. So the best approach is to really just rid yourself of the chemicals themselves and go through that withdrawal process. I, I've seen a lot of people that have gone through harm reductive methods of trying to get off of heroin and have developed just as strong, if not more severe addictions to the chemicals that they were given in replacement for the ones that they were taking. And you're creating this multiple drug addict now who's got um, a cocktail of different medications that they're taking and that's just drugs trying to solve drugs. So uh, in certain cases I think it's necessary. There are individuals that are suffering from issues that I have never had to experience. Mental disorders and, and extreme physical pain where, where drugs are necessary. But I'm gonna argue that a lot of people that develop substance abuse problems do it um, more out of experimentation and out of an emotional situation in their life that they were not managing. And the drugs become a way to escape that. It really is a two-tiered thing. Paid private care versus government subsidized care. And the, and the effectiveness of the two are staggeringly different. The model itself, the treatment model that's prevalent, especially in the subsidized treatment realm, um, is one of, of a needs-based machine-like service and less of a results-based uh, long-term approach to getting people completely free from substance abuse. And, and these environments that uh, most treatments are happening in become very prison-like and, and um, uh, they're, they're tough places to be. They're, they're not places where you're encouraged to really begin to look at your issues. They're places that are, are, are structured by rules that if you were to break them, you are immediately out the door. And I think that those subtle little things do help. In a moment when a person is in crisis, if you put your arm around them and say, let's give this another try, instead of saying, if you screw up, you're out the door, that can make all the difference. It's those tiny little hinge, hinging moments. And I think that in, when it comes to substance abuse, there's many different types of people. They're not all the same. Uh, people don't all have the same issue that they're suffering from. 
Um, you can't just superimpose on them one treatment modality and expect that you're going to get the same results for every person. So really what should be going on is there should be choice involved in treatment. People should be able to explore and research different modes of treatment and take the one that's going to be best suited for them. And, and it should be long-term enough, in my estimation, to really give them a good shot at living a drug-free life. Because once the drugs are cleaned up from your body, the real work begins. The 10% the, 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 the of getting over drug addiction is the physical aspects of it. The 90% is the work that has to come after that. So it's very important to make sure that we don't just um, sh shortchange our treatment efforts. You know that a friend is using and they want money from you or they've been picked up by the police or they need help and, and you're really close to them. In my opinion, is to use those moments as a moment where you can intervene on their behavior. You, you say, I'm not going to give you the $20, but I'm going to buy you the food and let's talk about your substance abuse. I love you. I care about you. Let's talk about this. They're at, they're at jail. Yes, I'm going to come and pick you up. Yes, I'm going to bail you out if you go to this treatment program. So when you're trying to address that as a family member, you need to attack the addiction, but love the person who's being affected by it. And it's not easy to do. I understand that it's not easy to tell somebody that, you're, that you have to leave my house if you're not going to go to treatment or you, I'm not going to pick you up from jail if you don't go to treatment. But the alternative is a person who dies from severe malignant drug abuse. You got to want this. You know, you got to... I wanted to get clean. I, I really, really wanted to be a different person. Up next, we look at living with bipolar disorder with Mario Pietrantoni and hear how upcoming filmmaker Brooks Hunter was able to overcome schizoaffective disorder. We can do it if you have the right treatment. We, we can overcome. My name is Mario Pietrantoni and I am a bipolar survivor. I was diagnosed when I was about 27. It takes over what you believe, you think you're Christ, and being Christ you feel you want to get your apostles together. So those type of things that you are really Christ and you are, you think you are God. And that's what happens in the state of, of a high, natural high. And, and, and when you're there, um, you're doing all these things because you, you also think you want to save the world, you want to save the people. When I'm in the lows, then you shut yourself off from the rest of the world and you automatically, you hate everybody around you and you snap at them and you're just, you're telling yourself what's going on with me. And but the most important thing is that um, families or relatives or friends or people you don't know, you could offend people very easily. The people around you don't know what you're going through and, um, and they think you're a laughing stock or whatever. Uh, they sort of, no, this guy's crazy. Uh, this guy's dumb and stupid. We don't want to deal with this, you know, with this idiot. It's like being in hell. That's what bipolar does to you. I checked in, in the hospital because I didn't know what was going on. And, and I got checked in at St. Michael's. And I was there for at least a couple of months for, to come down. And when they give you a bunch of uh, drugs, and they're very hard drugs to take, because it takes a lot to kind of uh, to, to be at that stage and then bring you back down. It's a wonder drug. When I started lithium back in, in the 70s, and uh, uh, late 70s, uh, lithium, uh, uh, gave me uh, an opportunity to um, to feel normal again, and uh, that I that I wouldn't have to worry about oh, getting high again or or the lows, because lithium played a 
has played a big part since then, and, and uh, I'm still on lithium. Lost relationships, and uh, I've lost jobs because of my illnesses, because it's sort of like a taboo. Who wants to be around a person who has all kinds of uh, conditions? And I figured, well, if nobody's going to hire me, I might as well try to be self-employed and be my own boss. For me, art was my salvation. That's why I paint or I, I draw or I work in jewelry, is to keep myself busy and hopefully, you know, make some money. It's not easy living with um, bipolar, but now I don't have, I don't have fear. I don't have, I feel comfortable talking about it. It's not, it doesn't matter who, who sees it, who doesn't see it. I was my experiences in my 20s that nobody knew exactly how to help me because they didn't even know themselves. Right now, 30 years later, there's sources, there's a lot of sources and there's a lot of help. It just, we got to create a bigger awareness. And this is what I'm doing now, is to create a, an awareness that there is help for them and not the biggest challenges. I don't want them to go through what I had to go through. I felt like I had a very important message, a very important vision for the world and for all human beings that I had to express. At various times I was diagnosed with depression, bipolar disorder, and schizoaffective disorder. The medications I've been on, Wellbutrin, Lithium, Lorazepam, Clonazepam, Risperidone, Ciprolex, Celexa, Seroquel, Paxil, Zoloft, Valproic Acid, Lomotrigine, Olanzapine, Trazodone. Schizoaffective disorder. It's one notch below schizophrenia where you don't see or actually hear anything, but you have these feelings that aren't necessarily real, where your friends hate you, your family hates you, intense paranoia, fear to leave the house. Um, just extreme anxiety, just, it's, it's, it's painful to exist. In grade 10, when I started feeling the extreme um, sadness where things, nothing was really enjoyable, I couldn't focus at school, I didn't feel like seeing friends, playing video games wasn't enjoyable. So I saw a family doctor, I started on Celexa, an antidepressant, I found Celexa didn't do anything, so I, I saw a couple different psychiatrists. So I was put on Paxil, but my behavior started changing to where I was very distant and disconnected and my family couldn't really talk to me anymore and the, the only thing I could really do was, was either you know, end things or make, make a big statement or a big impact where people understand that this is a whole other level of, of pain going on. So I actually recorded myself uh, smashing uh, ketchup bottles, barbecue sauce bottles with a bat in my basement. And apparently I was hiding knives around the house. Uh, throughout this period I went to the emergency room a couple of times. Without trying to commit suicide the hospitals wouldn't take uh, patients in unless the police brought you in. So my parents were you know, the only option they had was to call the police and, and, and have me escorted over to the hospital. So one day I was in my bedroom, there's a knock at the door, and the police are at my bedroom door, and I'm taken over to the hospital. And, and uh, as far as I remember, you know, I, I, of course I did not want to go in. So I was in the hospital for about a month and was put on four medications right away. I uh, was absolutely, you know, thrown into this other world that was just a complete shock to the system where I had to really accept what was happening in order to, to start to get well, but it took a long time to get to that acceptance. After the hospital, a long, long, long depression, and really there was, there was no improvement for you know, virtually two years. You know, the feelings were 
were very much suicidal on a daily basis and it was a matter of of mentally figuring out how to keep any amount of hope at all. Uh, cognitive behavior therapy was really the system that I began using to figure out what was real in a sense and what wasn't and cognitive behavior therapy essentially is writing down your thoughts on paper, analyzing them and by being able to do that it really helped me you know look at things from a third perspective, separate myself from myself. Every thought uh, helped structure itself to, to head towards a positive outcome and I did find a medication that that made a big difference and that was Seroquel which made a big difference right off the bat within a few days and it's an antipsychotic medication with heavy side effects but it was the first time I felt a little bit of relief and just enough to really help that self-coaching and that cognitive behavior therapy you know to, to test the waters and and go out to social events more and to see friends and, and, and really try things. So there were about five six years where I was on Seroquel and Lithium and things were stable I was functioning but I was really sick of not feeling the, the way I wanted to feel and I, you know, I lost faith in medication and in psychiatry and I started to convince myself that this was not about brain chemicals and about medication. This might be as simple as, you know, the way society is, the way the world is around me and it's all external. And I started to go lower and lower on my medications and it, it really, started a big crash where a lot of these intense symptoms came back and it was the the heavy anxiety the the the, the doom and the darkness and not being able to even get out of bed or do anything and that was such a disappointment that I was never really as close to suicide as, as at that point uh, I was able to eventually find a doctor and it was beginning from scratch with medication trials. Overall, I was able to actually get off Seroquel and be on other meds that were a lot lighter that I'm, I'm still on right now that, that really have next to no side effects. And I, I found a place, you know, within the past uh, three, four years that, that was a, just a very positive place, feeling good. And, and I can definitely say that I, I am where I want to be and I'm getting things done. My career is, is working and is starting to, to take off. I think it's essential that people who are diagnosed get into the mindset of positivity, motivation, building a momentum that they are important and their, their views are important. If you're diagnosed with something, well, express it, talk about it. What are your views on it? And, and not just be thrown into a corner and you know don't speak just here's what you have that's it and now we look at schizophrenia we hear from ms x who asked that her identity and voice be concealed because of her fears about the stigma surrounding schizophrenia. Then we bring you a very moving piece about a father, a daughter, and an illness. I was praying to Mother Mary and I just started to feel like her laying her hands on me. I'm, I'm not really sure if that's a hallucination or if that's an experience. Some of the experiences I had weren't necessarily bad ones, like some of them were positive. It's difficult for a person who's well to understand how a person who's ill can't understand that they're ill. But um, it's because you go through these experiences and they seem so real to you that you take the experience as being a part of life, not a part of an illness. I'm lucky because I don't really experience a lot of hallucinations. Like, there are some people I know who struggle with hallucinations every day, so they can't really get through a day. 
But me, it was like, they happened when I was going through stressful periods in my life, like moving away from home and having all these um, financial difficulties because I was in med school, which is really expensive and like lots of factors that played into my illness. I started to hear voices when I was in med school and that just made, led me to become paranoid. So that's, um, that was part of my illness. Because I heard voices, I thought people were talking about me. So it led me down a sort of a pathway where my mind sort of took on a paranoid view of the world. So I didn't associate with the friends that I had. I was isolated, but I was isolated because of the illness, because I was, you know, paranoid about people and that sort of thing. I have this psychotic symptom where when I read the words will, will jump out at me. I was very ill and I was, um, at that point I, I had started to read um, symbology into the, the letters that were jumping out at me. If I saw the letter A, I would think like, oh, they're saying that I'm right because they're giving me an A. When I saw in, it meant that I had inside information and like, like I had really started to read into a lot of these and I was convinced that people were lying about my illness and that um, that they knew the truth and that so I had a lot of delusional beliefs at that point to this day I really don't know what happened but it did feel like there was something strange going on because I had these weird hallucinatory premonitions like I felt like I don't know like anger and then um, like somebody was like holding a gun to my head or something like I felt like really like this like intense sense of anger and then I felt like these droplets of water and and like this sweet selling scent and then I felt like this like I felt like I was being attacked and then um and then I was like completely freaked out right and I even like I was even bleeding so I didn't really understand what what had happened um, but that was like, that just went in the vaults. Like I didn't tell anybody about it. Cause I was like that, if you tell people that they'll just think you're totally nuts. Right. So that was like, like, I didn't really talk about that experience until actually I was in hospital and I, and I told a doctor, um, and that was like a year into being in hospital that I told them about that experience. I became an inpatient at the CAMH in 2008. I was there till about October 2010. I was originally diagnosed with delusional disorder. I don't think they were aware of my illness because I didn't really describe it to people because I didn't want people to think I was crazy. So, <laughs> so I wasn't really forthcoming with all this information about my illness. Like, oh, did you know I experienced a hallucination last night? You know, like I, I never told people. So that's why I think it took a long time for me to, to be diagnosed. Once they had a fuller understanding of my symptoms, like the fact that when I read the words jumped out at me and um, that I was very paranoid about people and some of my experiences were bizarre experiences, they took that all into account and then they said that actually they thought I had schizophrenia paranoid. So that's the, the diagnosis they settled on. The first medication they put me on I couldn't sit still for five minutes. It was like internal torture. I couldn't watch a movie. I couldn't read a book. It was really hard. And I became suicidal on that medication. And it was actually a side effect of the medication because I looked it up. But um, the, the second medication they put me on made me lean to the side when I walked. So they didn't want that because then everybody would know that I was on medication because, you know, it was so obvious. Like I couldn't stand up. So, so they took me off that and then they put me on this one that just, um, well, I've gained a little bit of weight on it, but it's not like I've gained a ton of weight. So it's, it's okay. Like, um, for the most part, it's just that it sedates me. So like I'm tired during the day, but sometimes in the cost benefit analysis, sometimes the drugs don't really win. What I think really changed my life was they offered, they offered to let me take this course called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, which really broke down the, the thinking patterns that I had, which were unhealthy, like reading into symbols and um, feeling like people were talking about you. Like they had this one example where when you walk into a room and everybody stops talking, do you think they were talking about you, right? And when I was ill, I was like, yeah, I think they're talking about me, right? 
it helps to be able to tell someone like this too shall come to pass. I mean, I suffered for a long time, but for some reason when I turned 30, it was like an epiphany. Like I, like even though when I read the words still jump out at me and I still have some of the same symptoms, like I don't have the weird hallucinations. I don't have the bizarre, more bizarre experiences that I had when I was ill. It's not necessarily true that you're going to experience those symptoms for the rest of your life. Like I think um, for many people, they do recover. I think faith is an important part of my life because it's helped me deal with a lot of the things that I've been through. The Catholic Church always says there's meaning in suffering. It's, it's a good comfort to have. If I had no faith, I don't think I could have survived the things I survived without feeling like there was some meaning attached to it. To some extent, I do still believe that some people with mental health issues um, are either possessed by um, evil spirits or they have come in contact with evil spirits because like I don't really know how to explain some of the things that happened to me like they were so bizarre that I, I just don't think that there's any other explanation like I think that the doctors want to explain everything with the biomedical model but we don't really know what mental illness is. What does the word father mean to me? The word father um, I don't feel like I've had one. I don't know what that means. My father was diagnosed with schizophrenia when he was 21 years old. Phil is a, a very important person in my life and I love him. And I know he has love for me and what he's able to do. Where he falls in the spectrum of people who have schizophrenia is he's quite a severe case of it in that through all of my childhood into my teenage years and my early adulthood, he did not believe he was ill. So that happens uh, with some people with schizophrenia and, and it's a very, it gets in the way of their care and treatment. The way it impacted me was that it was always kind of a roller coaster of what might happen and dramatic outbursts of his delusional states coming in and out of our lives, going in and out of hospitals, psychiatric wards, and jails that then, you know, served to get him to a psychiatric ward. Because often with people like Phil, people who are on the street who have a mental illness that is untreated and they're homeless, the only way to get them treatment is if they do something that is against the law. So even if it was as simple as in a delusion he would steal a bike to get away from whatever voices he was hearing, stealing the bicycle would get him in jail that would get him care. first time I told anyone about Phil's illness, I was 19. People don't talk about it. Who, who announces that, uh, that they have a family member who's very ill and who's acting in ways that they don't understand, that are scary? So, so you have the fear, you have fear involved in that, you know, these people that you love are acting in ways that are often extremely scary, you know, that are not rational. So you're scared of that. You're scared on, on a personal level. I was so scared to get ill. You know, my father had this illness and I was so scared that it would happen to me. Um, and then the other fear goes with the shame of what will people think? What does this mean about us? And what happens in these types of families? Abandonment from the greater family because of a lot of the stigma and shame that comes around with, with having someone like Phil in your family. By the time I had photographed us and turned the camera on us, that was my only therapy. Photography was my tool and I took all these photographs. So the purpose of the book for me, that whole process, is I realized that the shame that I had, that I held about Phil's illness and about our situation and him being on the street was not my own to have. It was not appropriate. It was not fair. You know, he has a severe mental illness and people who are on the street who have his forms of mental illness are treated horribly.
by the majority of people who have no understanding of what's happening. So, so I felt a kind of responsibility also to share this and to have people understand that generally when you see a guy or a woman on the street picking out of the garbage or smelling or talking to themselves is because they're in you know, a dire mental health situation where they desperately need some kind of care and intervention. And finally tonight, a perspective on what life is like for the vast majority of people who never recover from mental illness. A look at what it is like to live forever with their condition. Adrienne McGinnis has suffered from anorexia since she was a teenager. This is her story on what it means to live with a lifelong illness. I watched kind of psychology and psychiatry move through a lot of phases because I was in it for 30 years. At that time in the 1980s, if you were termed long-term mental health, you were told you would never work again, you would probably never have successful relationships. So it was kind of like who I was at 20, my life had ended. Being sort of forced into treatments and being forced into that regime, I became very resistant. Um, and I fell out of the mainstream of treatment for eating disorders and I was often put on general wards. When you have an eating disorder, when you have any kind of psychological disorder that's termed long-term mental health, uh, treatment resistant, non-compliant, um, you fall into this whole other zone, living on disability, living on CPP, ODSP, being on private insurance. Uh, when you can't work, when you don't have access to the financial resources to upgrade your education, when you know that you can't do full-time work but you really do want to contribute to society, you feel like you live on the fringes and you do, you do. So what happens is you start to become more isolated. What happens when you become isolated? Isolation Social exclusion causes all kinds of problems. So when people say, why don't people get better? They don't look at the whole issue. They look at the illness and they say, this is the medical step you would need to take care of it. But when you take care of that medical part in a hospital and you throw the person back into a situation of unemployment, poor housing, poor nutrition, uh, a social group that's not positive, and you isolation, Those things cause mental illness again. So we're going, we're going in a circle. As a society, we have to address the, address the whole. And that is really a huge part of long-term mental illness. And that's the part that going into a hospital doesn't cure. I think the medical model is so important. There is a time in people with eating disorders, people with psychosis, people with depression, they absolutely need to be in the hospital. You're dealing with a medical situation. My worry about the medical system is that it's too skewed towards it, that pharmaceuticals have made it into an industry. What I like to see now is the recovery model that's coming in, the model where you live with your illness, that you learn to cope with the symptoms, that you get on with your life that you try to deal with some of the issues that brought on the sickness. Recovery is based on hope. It's having goals beyond your illness. It's seeing yourself as a whole human being, not as a label, not as an illness. People with long-term mental illness, they can be productive for maybe weeks, maybe months, but during that time they can contribute. The problem with it is the symptoms come back. So I think it's something that companies and insurance, private companies, they have to make accommodations for that. It's not like you go into treatment, you come back to work and three months later you're better. It means this is gonna be a lifelong thing of in and out. 
but we, I watch so many lives wasted because of the way things are set up right now. They need to redefine wellness and illness. They need to work harder to make accommodations. They need to see the positive of people's contribution that have mental illness. Some of the most brilliant people in our society were deemed as different, okay? They were different. They had odd behaviors, but who defined odd in our lives? Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.